Can you see me? Uh, now we can yeah. hear you. Yeah. You can hear me. So, uh, hear me. Yes. okay, I've got a problem here. So when I got this link, I opened it with Firefox browser. This is my preferred and default browser. But uh, I think he prevents uh, to use the camera for, for reasons I don't know. So I just opened up the, the Google Chrome. And uh, luckily you can hear my voice, but I don't know what's wrong with the camera. So okay, don't know what you look like. But at least you can hear me. I think it's, it's uh, more important than just... Okay, well, while we're waiting for the uh, various students to come on, uh, what do you think? What are, okay, what are your prospects for uh, uh, obtaining, building, trying out a uh, a contact microscope? Uh, it's a difficult question. I didn't make any any. Uh, uh, attempt to uh, build such a microscope, so I'm really not not sure that I can do that. Um, at the at the moment, I'm occupied with a lot of other things, uh, so uh, I think it will take some time to be successful in, in building up such a microscope. I, I know I understand the idea behind, uh, but I think it's not that easy because you need uh, a chip which is very smooth and. Uh, can bring it in contact to water without a problem. And um, anyway, you have to keep the uh, Bacillaria colonies very flat. So if, if they're just not in, in a tight contact to the substrate, uh, then uh, you have a protection. So you don't have it uh, perpendicular to the uh, optical axis. So uh, in that case, you're facing the same problem as you have it right now. And uh, the uh, point is, if you uh, just bring it uh, between two um, surfaces, like um, um, two glass um, plates, uh, maybe a slider and um, cover slip, uh, then the diatom have an attachment, the tendency to adhere to one of these surfaces and ah. it them from moving. So. Just to have them freely moving, uh, you have them. Uh, they have to have them in free water, in free waters, and um, so it's 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 a big problem. So the uh, video we are just considering now uh, are great in the respect that they are moving freely, with uh, the exception of diatom number one, because that's attached to the uh, uh, substrate, and all the other uh, freely. So it's it's really a. a Great luck to have such an opportunity to take uh, such a video. So this makes it so exceptional. Yes, yes, I, I see. Okay, I was wondering. So you didn't intentionally attach to time number one. You were just lucky. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not one of my, my skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Blue and I've never seen that before with uh, one of one of the cell phone colony attached. <laughs> okay, they have their own view. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I said, the next paper was going to, is going to be on psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I just see that uh, Bradley, you have also written a, a meal email. Yeah, um, sent you one. Okay. Okay, so um, I just uh, sent both to you an email just uh, a second before, just simultaneously uh, to your mails. And um, this is just a, a picture showing that they really behave uh, like a sinus wave. So they have a really a strict periodicity. And it's, it's really striking that these diatoms uh, follow all the rules. Uh, which we are expecting. So it's uh, really a uh, um, great luck to have this uh, video. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thomas, do you understand what I meant by an FM wave? Pardon? Do, do you understand what I meant by describing it as an FM wave? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, in, in radio, there are the two general uh, ways of broadcasting, AM and FM. I was a radio amateur uh, in the work in telecommunications, so I know what you're talking about. Oh, okay, okay, great. 
It's, 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 do you understand the difference? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, a, AM, the, the amplitude goes up and down, and FM, the frequency varies. Yeah. yeah. So these are closer to an FM wave than, than an AM wave. Yeah, I think the idea would be if I have more cycles, then uh, to make the Fourier transform and to uh, yeah. look in, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the spectrum of, of that, this really would explain that. So if you have an FM, so it's not just one peak and, and uh, line, so it has, it's broadened. Uh, mm -hmm. But for that, uh, I have to really to work out and, and to analyze the whole video. Yeah, also the uh, the variation in the amplitude and the frequency might yeah. be interesting. Whether or not there's any correlation from one cycle to the next. Yeah, uh, if you if you look the the video until really until the final end, you uh, will see that this colony comes to rest. So it uh, it, it takes the the complete parallel uh, uh, situation at the end. It's not moving on and on. Stacked so, or extend? Do you mean stacked or extended? Uh, no, it's it's a stack. Stack. Oh, yeah. okay. So we're going to the what we call the resting stage. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So uh, for that reason, the amplitude goes down. Uh, as, as yeah, that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Margaret Kapinga's observations when she did her thesis with me was that uh, when you turn the lights off, they stacked. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's true. Uh, if you are watching uh, a colony, it um, has a mixture of different forms of colonies. Um, okay. Yeah, at noon, for instance, uh, the major part of the uh, colonies is moving, and you, they are they are um, taking the stretched and elongated form, and then return again. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are in rest position. So the uh, amount of, of colonies uh, is increasing as uh, it's approaching the uh, evening. And in the dark, mm. major part is in the rest position, but there's statistics. So Do you think there's a wavelength of light at which you could observe them, but which for them would appear to be night? Uh, yes, I, I, made, I made a trial to observe them in the infrared. But, uh, oh, really? Not, First trial, so it's not a complicated thing. But uh, uh, the most microscopes I'm using are not uh, really um, uh, usable for, for that because they have LED enlightenment, LED lamps, and the LED lamps don't have an infrared uh, part. So oh, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and this is bad to be getting away from incandescent. Inverted <laughs> microscope is only a, a uh, normal bulb, and uh, there I can make these experiments. So, but I'm just very at the begin at the very beginning. So uh, it's it's too early to give any answer. But um, collecting um, well uh, impressions, ideas, and observations. So I'm just uh, watching particles moving along uh, the diatoms, the outer diatoms, and um, uh, measuring the speed of them. And uh, my impression uh, just right now is that they move with the, exactly the same speed as the diatoms move relatively uh, to the edge. Did uh, you see the particles moving that are far from the colony? Uh, good question. So I gave you an answer in, in my last mail. Maybe they are just um, uh, moved by the uh, water current, by the water flow. I'm not uh, that I don't think so. I don't think they have a very uh, low um, uh, Reynolds numbers in, in, in the low level. Uh, I suspect there's a cloud of uh, of the sticky uh, yes. uh, red fluid around them. It's, I, I think you may be right. You may be right. Uh, I don't have any, any objections, but I can't prove uh, either the one or the other. Uh, Idea. Yeah, there's that. Yes, I had an old movie uh, which was available online, which showed that phenomenon. Uh, uh, let's see if I. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, but there's some, some flakes uh, which are attached to the diatoms. Uh, they are moving along with the diatoms, and this is uh, pretty much clear that they are in mechanical contact with the diatoms, and, and for that reason. They are moving together with the diatoms, but 
independent looking particles uh, may be the major problem. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. But the ones that are far away uh, are a different matter. Getting getting motion right next to the diatoms is going to be hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. Ryan. Okay. Sorry for, for my camera problem. I don't know what to do. Yeah. The camera is lit, so it's indicating that it's taking pictures, but uh, and I have a button here for deactivating the camera, but uh, it doesn't seem to produce pictures. What do you mean? Uh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, I was having a problem with that earlier, so I wouldn't worry about it. It Sometimes it is a little tricky. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this is the reference. Unfortunately, it's no longer online, but I think I have a copy of the movie. Uh, okay. Oh, Plankton Theater. <laughs> yeah. That's a, uh, that's a movie. Okay, it's in the, in the chat. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see yeah. It doesn't open, so I can't see anything here. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's no longer online, but I think I made a copy before it disappeared. Yeah. Uh, I was copy to my cloud, so one of the uh, folders are open to uh, upload for you. Or you put it on the sink. No, it's, it's, it's not here. Now, can I send files through here or no. no? No. Okay. Is it like a video? Well, it, it's a dot mov file. Oh, okay. Well, you can. Um, Let me. You could share your screen and show it. And oh yeah, if you can see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a second here. Okay. Hi, Jesse, how are you? Okay, first let me make sure it's the right movie. All right. <laughs> Hi, I probably won't be able to say much today, but I... Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. uh, interesting discussion so far. Okay. Okay, let me uh, share the screen here. How do, uh, where is that? Let me have to share the screen. Yeah, the lower right. The lower right, right, huh? Yeah. Oh, I don't I see it? Oh, there it is. Present now. Okay. Entire screen. Okay, good. Now let me try to get it going again here. Okay, let me blow it up. Okay, so there's, see that? I'm not sure what that big oh, thing yeah. is. I don't see your screen. No. Oh, you don't see my screen? No, it doesn't seem to be sharing yet. Oh, uh, that's weird. Okay, well, let me go back to trying to share it again. Yeah, it says present now. If you click on that, and it should say, like, either, well, it might oh, be a window or whole screen. So oh, oh, I see. I didn't, I didn't. Yeah. Oh, it's a two-step thing. Yeah. No, not one step. There we go. Okay. I see it now. Okay. Let's try it again. Okay. There it is. Here it is. I'll blow it up. Okay, so there's the colony at the top, but you see this big monster thing. And watch how it, it's some distance. Also, if you look in the background, you can see lots of texture to the background. It's there's transparent material, but it's not completely uniform. Okay, it's very short. Okay. So as the colony moves, this other structure, which is quite a distance from the colony, moves back and forth. But you can see a whole cloud of material in the movie. Yeah. Uh, that moves with it. Okay. Okay. And uh, what I'm saying is I think you, in the movie you sent us, you have the same phenomenon. There's a cloud, but uh, I think the cloud could be labeled. You may not be able to get labeled right near the cells, but I think you could label the cloud. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Um, is it one of the movies uh, available on YouTube? So you can... This one? I remember that video. I have seen it before. Oh, this one? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's on YouTube now. I, I had it from that source and yeah. I, I downloaded it and then it disappeared. I, I that, that's uh, 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 with the big sphere. Well, I, let's see. It's not that big. I can... Uh, Maybe a email attachment, even. Yeah, yeah. I'll, send, I'll send it by email. Okay. Just say, yeah. What's how big the thing is? Be nice. Oh. Yeah, uh, two megabytes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's short movie. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll put that in email right now. Great. Okay, so I'll quit presenting here and. Uh, Turn the agenda over to uh, Bradley. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Richard and Thomas, for that update on the Basel area stuff. So, yeah, I was looking through the – I haven't really had a chance to look through Thomas's uh, revisions and, and, like, his stuff that he sent. He sent a, a pretty long email about it. So I'm going to go through that later this week or by the, the end of the week probably and have a longer response. But it looks okay. good. I think that uh, – Definitely, okay. you know, we're kind of, kind of like staking out new ground here. So, yeah, but <laughs> method of, of tracking, uh, so just picking up a part of the picture and following that, and the uh, program is great for, for doing that. So it's, it's really not uh, coding work, and uh, it just took me two days to work it out and to, to present the results. So just give me a feedback. What do you think about? Uh, making an appendix to your paper and uh, just for comparison and saying what's possible with classic methods. I think uh, it really works only if you have a, a perfect video where the uh, colonies are moving perpendicular to the uh, observation direction, to the optical axis, and there you have enough structure in each diatom to identify it this way. Um, in this video, I think uh, it's one of the reasons why I think it's, it's the best I have. Um, you can do that and you can follow that and you can also determine um, not only the, the position but also the speed very accurately and you see it's, it's not um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy to model that. Uh, but anyway, so I will work it out in detail but uh, for, for the paper which is in work, uh, the idea is maybe just with a proposal to make it a little appendix, just to say in the paper, um, there are also methods, classical and known methods for, for tracking uh, parts of, of a picture, and that could be used as well. But uh, it's not as flexible as uh, artificial intelligence and the machine learning approach. So it's, it's not comparable. So in some cases, maybe it's more um, effective, it's more successful to use these classical methods, but in general, I would say the powerful method, uh, which paves the way for, for uh, future investigation, is the uh, machine learning approach. So it's my personal opinion, and I would uh, really uh, uh, stick to that. And uh, just for, for the readers to see what's also possible with simple methods in a few hours, uh, I think that could be helpful. That's the idea behind. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to interpret it too. Um, so yeah, I'll look it over and I'll, I'll give you some feedback. Oh, it's, I mean, it looks like you know everything is good. So uh, thanks for <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that. And we'll just keep talk. Well, you know, you can provide. I don't know what additional information you want to provide, but I'll, I'll ask you if I need anything specific on you know special that you haven't uh, provided. So. Yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah, thanks. Uh, so Jesse, uh, I saw that you were busy. <laughs> we were discussing, and this is kind of a little bit. Well, it actually isn't. Uh, we were discussing, like you said, that you wanted to find out, like how to sort of navigate <clears throat> the area of uh, machine learning and all that. And you said you didn't really have a background in in biology or machine learning too much. So 
we we had this discussion and I sort of came up with the idea of looking at the knowledge maps uh, repository and uh, so do you want to give a little bit of you want to think about you want to talk about that a little bit or uh, I'm not in familiar with all these uh, uh, techniques I uh, have to admit uh, so uh, hard to contribute uh, to, to that so um, I think it's, it's uh, what I've done really is not in line of what you have done. So it's it's a just different approach. So, um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Um, yeah. So Jesse, did you have anything uh, to say about that? <laughs> yeah, um, I think quickly what I'll say is I it's it's it all a little bit more in my mind as I go and I do see I think it could fit in well with some of like the education components of the lab but also kind of act as a way of consolidating a lot of things that I'm trying to learn into at least a map. I'm not saying that I'm you know going to put all of my learnings into one particular thing here. But more like, I feel like for someone like myself, and I have friends who are in the same boat too, having kind of a, the knowledge maps are nice, but I feel like a little bit more, uh, um, I don't really know what kind of a map to call it, but a map that incorporates, okay, here's what happened, but then here's also kind of an associated set of skills that you should at least be aware of, or, or issues or challenges in related fields that you can kind of be aware of and then tailor your own education towards, and then maybe some suggestions or, like in my own actual work, doing projects related to those things. Because I feel like a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of what feels like foundational work to do before I can get to where I want to go. Um, so it's kind of just acknowledging that in the sense of something that it's, it is interdisciplinary. There is a lot of things going on. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, what, I, what for me has been like non-traditional, um, I guess, approaches or at least perspectives. So creating a more coherent. I don't really want to say like a lesson plan. I don't really want to say like a, like making a course about it. Like I know we talked about the complexity or or set by recently. Yeah. Um, and it's not. I'm not sure to what degree that is, but I I think about it quite a bit to talk about it with okay. some of my friends who are further along the path than me and also who are in my same boat and and I think I think there will be something good to come up with. Yeah. So I mean like and I can speak for myself. I don't know, you know, a lot of this stuff is pretty new, so I didn't I didn't learn this in school necessarily. Uh, so, I mean, like, and this is true of everyone, when, when new things come up, you know, you have to kind of pick up, pick them up as you go, and, like, so I, I guess, yeah, I, I like the idea of, like, creating maybe not formal education materials, but, like, you know, sort of pointers to things, but also to have a good, like, you know, the, the idea about the knowledge maps is that you have... Uh, key readings or key events in the field, or so the things that are contributing to uh, yes. machine learning or AI or developmental biology or whatever, you know, and, and people do this with literature reviews, but to have like a visual thing where you can like look at it and see the, you know, the milestones and like, you know, things that contribute. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. And I think. You know, especially when you're trying to learn things sort of on your own, on the fly, those are helpful. So, yeah, I wanted to go back to the, the uh, I, I remember the tutorial resources, I wanted to revisit that. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, I'm going to show it. Did I see that before? Oh, no, this, yeah, well, this is for the Diva Worm ML, and I think we talked about it a little bit, but I don't know how much people have seen uh, recently. So this is, again, uh, this is one example. Uh, I, I sort of started this as a way to, like, you know, give people, like, if you wanted, if you knew almost nothing about machine learning, you could go to these references and get some idea of what's going on. So 
uh, and this is this needs to be improved, but this is sort of what we have. This is all text, really. Uh, so we have a section off the shelf tools. So you have a set of tools that you can, you know, uh, you know, rival tools that you can look at and see which one works best for you. Uh, major venues. So you know, there's some uh, peer review journals in here, uh, but a lot of the action actually happens on archive and in this thing called the still, which is an open journal. And so you know that like it's good to have an idea of where to find this work. Where is it published? Where is it discussed? Uh, and then we have uh, so, you know some examples of like pre-trained models. So we have the blog post, but we also have this set of models that you know you can look at examples of. Uh, then special topics. So it, it's almost kind of structured like maybe a course you would have at a university, almost like a syllabus. So we were talking about open syllabi, you know, just having like something assembled that you can go through and, you know, look at special topics. Um, you know, so this is just general topics, special topics like naive bays, evolution strategies. And you say, well, what are those? And well, you can link to them. You can find out more about them. Um, and then, you know, topics like innateness versus a data driven blank slate which is a, 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 you know, pretty decent argument in the literature. People are arguing whether you need to have like prior representations or just learn things from data. And so, you know, there's some things. This isn't like an exhaustive bibliography, but I think, you know, again, it's something that people can go to and like look at, you know, look at those references and go to other references. But that's why I'd actually like to have maps because, you know, this, it, it, uh, you know, you can give people references, but it's like, hard to integrate all that information. So having a map is a good tool, a good sort of top-down tool. Okay, yeah, so Jesse says, yes, a syllabus and key issues or branches of development in a field that can help a lot. So, yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is, uh, you know, this is kind of structured like a syllabus, but it's meant to get people some... Uh, you know, some background on different topics, different, get a feel for the field. And then, of course, we have MOOCs and general tutorials. So those have been invaluable, I think, especially for like, uh, for this field, because it moves so fast. You know, you have uh, different MOOCs, rival MOOCs, like uh, Jeff Hinton offers one, Andrew Eng offers one. These are just people who have, are top researchers in the area. Uh, but you also have, you know, uh, tutorials that you can work through. So I've included those as well. And then of course, references. And so uh, references, that again could be done either just by listing references or through like a bibliography, like a EndNote or a, a Zotero bibliography where people can contribute and download. And, um, but I mean, for this, for this purpose, again, it's just kind of like really basic stuff um and so yeah i mean that that's that's sort of like uh for jesse you know like that would be for just for machine learning and maybe some biology i have another reference for um a diva worm so when i do the uh summer of code stuff i get people you know they they come to me and they want to do a project they want to write a proposal uh and then either at that point or maybe if they're selected and they want to get in uh sort of get sort of immersed in the topics like basic c elegans biology say oh i have a, re a set of references for that too and they uh are able to uh, go through those i've done this in a way that's uh let me see if i should be right here So yeah, this is uh, basic biology references. So again, this is not exhaustive, but it gives students a basic idea of what's going on. So with C. elegans, we're lucky that a lot of these references already exist. So, you know, I point them to things like the, there's a interactive cell lineage. Uh, there are different things like Wormbase and Wormbook, which actually give you a lot of 
fundamental information. So Wormbook has a lot of fundamentals on like C. Elegans biology. So this is a this is curated in the community of C. Elegans researchers. Um, you know, this is it's open access. You have original peer reviewed chapters on all different topics, molecular biology, developmental control, and so forth. Now they're at a, a rather high level, but you know this is going to be in conjunction with some other references resources. So the virtual worm model, I like this because you can go from like an article like that to like this virtual model of C. elegans, and so this is the actual model here. And you can play with it. You can like uh, you can add in cells. It's not working right now, but uh, okay. Here's an example. Oh, these are screenshots. Okay, so you know you can look up specific cells in this model. And so this is an adult C. elegans, and the the C. elegans is unique because they have every cell mapped in the adult. And so you can actually play with the different cells in the adult. And this is actually a neuron with projections. And you can actually learn, like, you know, in the literature, they'll talk about specific cells. You can go back to this and look at the cell and where it is and, you know, maybe get some information about what it does. And so I need to maybe work on this as well because this is very sort of just links. You know, it's very textual. I was kind of hoping to annotate this. I never got around to it. But this is another reference. And then... Microscopy, where uh, I've had students interested in microscopy to say, like, I read this stuff when I want to come into the group or when I want to write a proposal, but I don't know any really anything about microscopy. And so there are some existing microscopy tutorials, but these are things that, you know, again, you can point them to. And again, you know, people sometimes come at this with almost no experience in, like, biology or maybe no you know, most of the people I've had have no experience in biology, so I have to give them a crash course. But I'm not going to sit there with a slide deck for four hours and go through it. And, you know, I think this is more useful. Um, you know, and then you have some papers here. Again, this is a, just an abbreviated uh, bibliography, but it's something I think we can, they can learn, learn a little bit more about the topic. So, I mean, those are, those are different options. And again, I think my goal, I think, long term for that stuff is to make it more visual, to have like, uh, you know, images or like, I like the uh, virtual worm simulation because you can do, um, you know, you can actually look and see what the cells are, what, you know, the spatial relationships are, and you don't have to, you know, go find a specimen or dissect it. Uh, you know, it's all labeled. So, um yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, basically, I think that's helpful, to, like in Jesse's case, where, he, you know, you get, people come into a field and they don't really know very much about it. how do they get oriented. It's a common problem, but, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of times it's hard um, to get the information you need. So, um, also, yeah, I saw Jesse that you made a infographic on uh, of your own. On like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, so I like that. That was pretty good. Uh, you have a lot of uh, milestones on it. Um, you are you planning to get onto that, or what do you? I didn't make it from scratch. <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, you know, that, like, I've, I've done a couple of them where you kind of go to different sources on the web and you, yeah, so you, you put, you find out when the events took place, you put them on the, on the map, and the idea is to have, like, a collection of points, <laughs> you know, data points in your history, and you, you know, you can augment it by putting in, like, uh, you know, key references for each milestone, that's sometimes good. Um, so yeah, there are all sorts of things you can do there. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's whatever's helpful to you, I think, is a good idea. Um, 
So I, I actually today I was going to present on uh, game theory and uh, modeling, but I'm not going to do that this week because uh, Vinay couldn't make it, and um, yeah. So I, I was just going to wait on that for next week. Uh, I hope everyone. Uh, I know everyone saw the blog post by now, the one that we put up for. Uh, okay, it's taking shape more and more. So we had the first blog post, which was the uh, pre uh, the pre-trained models blog post, and so that was a I thought that was a nice uh, let's share that maybe for uh, let's see okay here it is uh, let me share my screen this is for for Thomas's benefit. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to show them what we were up to in the group here so uh we've been working this like this fall on different topics in machine learning and developmental biology and uh <laughs> came up with this topic pre-trained models for developmental biology so a pre-trained model is a model that like i mentioned in the paper where you can create a model that's best specific to a certain type of data. It could be like a feature like a, a rectangle, or it could be like um, features like a, a sphere, or it could be like words and things like that. So you have a benefit of having features that, you know, are similar to the ones you want to extract from your data, but they're, you know, the model's already trained to do that. So you don't really need as much input data. You can actually just use that to extract the kinds of things you want. It's very targeted as opposed to like a more general algorithm where you're training it to learn just kind of from scratch. I mean, this isn't like, um, you know, an, an AI where you might teach it a language, uh, but or like phonemes or something like that. But it's just kind of a something where you already know kind of what you're looking for. And so we talk about some of these things in here. We talk about pre-trained models. And we talk, then we go in, in this part, we talk about a vision for a developmental biology specific model. So in this case, we're thinking about developmental biology and like, you know, embryos and cells and things like that, motion, growth, and all those things. And we're kind of trying to get our, our heads around, you know, what might be, you know, if it's feasible and maybe what might be required. So we don't get into a lot of technical detail in this um, post, but if we do mention the stuff, uh, Basilaria stuff and the C. Elegan stuff in terms of the projects this summer. Um, and so, you know, just kind of like discussing a little bit about the challenges there. Um, and then... We don't really, I mean, we don't really, uh, it's, then there's an advertisement for the Devorm ML group, which we're now in. But I don't, we didn't really propose any specific type of pre-trained model. That's maybe sort of for next summer. <laughs> I might try to have a Google Summer of Code project where we actually try to build one. But I'm not sure yet. Um, it, you know, this is like a stepwise thing. Uh, you have to put out a vision, then you have to, um, actually implement it, which is much harder. But I think that's a, I think it's a good way to sort of merge the two areas. Uh, uh, you know, I don't really think there's a lot of work that's been done on developmental biology and machine learning, um, you know, other than maybe just applying it to problems. But this is kind of a new thing that um, we're kind of proposing here. Um, let me give you a link to the blog post. So this is the, it's also posted to another blog, but I cross-posted it here to maximize the impact. So this is the blog post for Thomas for, you know, I know Richard and Jesse have seen it, but, um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a, definitely, it's just kind of proposing a big picture view of, of uh, pre-trained models and then how we might implement one for developmental biology, but we haven't given much thought to that, um, other like the technical details of it. Um, and then the other thing is, is that 
want to do one more blog post by the end of the year, like by the end of the calendar year. And so I don't know, probably in the next couple weeks, we'll talk about maybe what that might be. I want to talk a little bit about game theory to kind of kind of draw out some issues in that area. And I think it's actually, in doing research for that, it's really interesting, some of the stuff that's going on. So uh, really kind of a short version of it. Last week we were talking about models competing with one another. So like in the, in the GANs, we had a generative model to, that was generating fake samples. And then we had data being classified by a classifier. And there was a competition between the two uh, deep learning models to sort of, you know, uh, maximize the parameters. You know, is it that your classifier is being able to, you know, the idea here is that you're, you're, you have data that you're classifying. So I might have a data set that's very clear and very simple, where I have very uh, clear visual features. And your classifier is extracting those features and saying whether they're, you know, one thing or another. And then your, um, your generator is generating adversarial examples. So that means it's generating things that are similar, but not really the same thing. And so the idea is that that classifier then ta also takes in that information and has to correctly classify those adversarial examples. Now, sometimes those adversarial examples are real or, or like, you know, different versions of the stimulus, maybe at an angle or, or rotated. And sometimes they're just nonsense. Uh, so then, you know, it's the work of the classifier to get all that right. And so there's a competition going on between those two models. And that's where the game theory comes in. And it's really interesting how people have applied game theory. Uh, but at the same time, it's a very open area. There hasn't been a lot of work done on like really understanding uh, like what's possible. People have applied the concept of the Nash equilibrium, which is where you have, uh, you know, you have an equilibrium where you can't like, uh, you know, come up with a better strategy to, to defeat your enemy. So you have to stick with a, a certain set of strategies, each player. And, you know, they can't ever improve their position in the game by using another strategy. So they fall into this equilibrium. And it's really interesting how people apply it to uh, performance of models because, I mean, that's something that I wouldn't have thought of before I heard of GANs. Like, <laughs> something I would have come up with maybe on my own, but eventually, but I don't think I would have thought about it and said, oh, that's an obvious thing that you would have in that area. So I'll give that talk next week. I know I don't want to, I uh, didn't want to do it today. And uh, let's see, I don't know if there's anything I want to talk about this week, but um, I've related to this. I think I'll save it for next week. So next week we'll have that presentation and maybe we'll consider what we might do for another blog post. Uh, first of all, I should ask, does anyone have any ideas of their own about what they'd like to do for a, a second blog post? We can also do something more biologically oriented too. Um, I was thinking, uh, you know, you know, we didn't do in the pre-trained model blog post, we didn't really have a lot of biology in it. Actually, I wish we would have had some screenshots, um, but they didn't, couldn't really find anything suitable. Um, but we could, you know, uh, we could do something more along the lines of, uh, you know, comparing more classical methods. Maybe something if we get the paper, you know, and it doesn't have to be this year, but like a blog post that accompanies the the book chapter or some aspect of the book chapter too. Oftentimes people will do that to sort of augment their, um, you know, their people reading their article. If you do something that's a little bit more, um, you know, less specialized in terms of the writing. So, I mean, that's sort of why I started blogging in the first place it was to like get, have a outlet where it wasn't as technical. Of course, it still ends up being pretty technical, but um, that's a possibility too. Um, you know, and you don't have to decide now, but you know, if you can 
let me know soon. Um, just contact me, email, Slack, whatever. Um, we can talk about it some more. Uh, am I getting any responses from readers of the note? I haven't gotten any like uh, responses. So we have the the guy from China, um, but he's you know I mean I don't know where he learned about that. It sounds like he may have read that blog post, but I don't know. Other than that, I haven't gotten much response from people. It's you know I think you know it's hard to a lot of people. Uh, in developmental biology, they don't really have a lot of background in it. So it's like, or, you know, maybe we're pitching at a too high a level um, for people for it to be useful to a lot of people. That's why maybe an intermediate uh, post would be maybe, you know, more received on, in that community. Um, and when I say uh, intermediate post, I mean something more basic, like, you know, how to how to apply an algorithm to some data. Um, but I, you know, I don't know how deep in the weeds, I mean, otherwise it just becomes a tutorial, um, which might not be a bad thing. It's just, you know, um, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it might be something that people, you know, because the note is, I guess it's mostly developmental biology, but you know, what, what does that mean? Like, do people really have the background to get into something that's, or are they are they interested? So sometimes a lot of people, um, if they're in a certain area, will think that things aren't really relevant to them. Like sometimes you know there are new techniques that come out that people say was not really relevant to me. So I mean there's a case for making something relevant to people. Um, but I don't know. I, I haven't had any responses from the node post, so it's hard to know really what how people find it useful or if they maybe they do find it useful maybe it takes a while for them to figure that out like you know they send it to their friends and then they send it to their friends and then someone says oh yes this is a great article or a great blog post mm -hmm. let's see we have any other chat okay that was uh, that one. Oh, uh, Thomas. I, I don't actually know how many people are uh reading your blog post uh, are the many have your counter uh well i've had some basic analytics probably between the two posts maybe 50 or 60 which isn't doesn't sound like a lot but it's not a it's a specialized area so i yeah. usually get yeah it usually takes a while for people like i said to get it to start reading it like you'll get some hits and it's usually like you know they calculate a, a read is like if you stay at the site for more than three or four minutes, so people are reading part of it maybe, but they're also sending it on to their friends or colleagues, hopefully. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it'll take a while to really know, but... <laughs> That's just a, a very uh, small portion of the visitors of a, a more or less scientific uh, website uh, are responding to the author and... Uh, I have the same problem with my uh, website on diatoms. Uh, I know that a lot of people uh, coming to this site and uh, staying for a while, but uh, just really a few uh, giving me some response. It's quite normal. It's pretty normal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, Richard said, I've occasionally posted on Node with no response. Yeah, I don't know if people are really, again, it really depends on the, platform uh some and i've gotten like responses on things just via email but it's you yeah. know it's like people will read it and then they'll have to go and respond you know like it's an extra step for people so sometimes they'll respond and sometimes they're really interested but they don't yeah. okay so richard has a link okay so i posted the jesse asked which link is best to send to others and i posted the node version of this in the chat so jesse that's the the version probably the preferred version to send other people um okay uh now richard is pointing us to this paper in the chat vasan malagar malakar williams and uh ranjamani d light uses cell cell interface movement to better infer cell cell tensions so this is a biophysics paper biophysical journal so what what is special about this paper? Uh, 
the portal. Well, yeah, we could use a portal. I would imagine uh, on advanced methods of analysis and embryos. It might, yeah, that might be a good idea too. I think, uh, you know, like I was showing Jesse, we have like a sort of basic reading list, but also I think a portal would be useful too if people are going to, you know, if you want to have a, like a clearinghouse of methods, um, and then you have to decide like who do you want to appeal to. You know, this is the thing about open worm. Uh, we get people who are, you know, kind of casual learners. Uh, you get like people with maybe an undergraduate level background or maybe they're even, you know, high school students or something. And then you get people who are like hardcore researchers. And so you have these two groups that you have to, that are interested in these resources, but of course they're going to have to be pitched differently. And so uh, I like the portal idea uh i mean they're probably i don't know who would would that be something that we would just point people to resources or would we have to create biology is usually led by non-biologists entering the field mm -hmm. this is how molecular biology started yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so like you know with with our with our group we get a lot of computer scientists and they don't really know that much about biology, so that's always the challenge. Um, but then you also get biologists who want to know, like, you know, because you do have tools like the like the atlases and things like that that are digital, and they want to, you know, kind of link it to their work. And so it's uh, it's always a challenge to get to satisfy both groups of people. But yeah, um, yeah. so. I think that's I think that's good. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, so, Dick, did you want to talk? Did you want to uh, mention that paper that you posted in the chat? Did you want to provide some information, more information about it, or is that just something you wanted to point to? Yeah, basically, information is always good to give some opportunity. So, keep me yeah. in the loop, uh, possibly. Yeah. This paper came out yesterday, literally. <laughs> Steve McGrew uh, pointed it out to me. Okay. And it's a curious paper because it's uh, it's done by engineers. Uh, in fact, I couldn't even find any mention of a particular organism in it. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, it's it's built on well it. It's an advancement over a program called uh, CellFit, which was written by Wayne Broadland and his crew. Now, Wayne retired about a year ago, and uh, uh, CellFit is no longer being developed, as far as I can tell. Uh, but uh, it's based on a paper that I wrote with Murray Steen, who was a medical student at the time, back in 1982. Uh, where we did something terribly simple. We, we took two sheets of glass and blew a bunch of bubbles inside between the two of them. So we had a, a, a flat array of bubbles. And then we took a picture of the bubbles and we fit curvatures to all of the edges of the bubbles and uh, uh, showed that we could uh, calculate the pressure inside, which was pretty uniform. Okay. okay, and uh, the idea then is that this was a model for a, a sheet of cells and that you could generalize it and therefore measure the pressures and the forces between cells uh, in, a, in a real epithelium from the shapes of the cells, from the curvatures of the boundaries between the cells. So it's sort of like it's seg you'd have to segment the images but also get the curvature at each boundary between each pair of neighboring cells. Okay, so this is not being done, and these guys are doing a very nice job of it. Uh, so this is an, it's an example of the uh, quite sophisticated analysis. Now it involves uh, image segmentation, finite element analysis. They're only doing it in two dimensions. It has to be moved to three dimensions, uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, I'm working with. Uh, uh, Susan Crawford Young, who, uh, who has developed a flipping microscope, which allows one to see all the whole surface of an axolotl embryo. Okay, so 
to be pulling this stuff together. It, the, what I'm saying is there's a lot of work ahead and this field is starting to move now and it might be, it might be appropriate to create a portal and see if we can attract people to it and, and start putting key references on it so people know where the literature is. Yeah. What the methods are. Uh, you know, you've introduced a whole bunch of stuff. We're analyzing differentiation trees. Uh, so that could be a whole sec section of it. Okay? Absolutely. So I think build it up. I, I think that's better than blog because blogs, blogs tend to reach a few people and then they disappear, whereas portals can last a long time. Yeah. Okay? Now, there can be a blog associated with the portal, but the portal becomes the, uh, uh, the main thing. And if it's a well-maintained portal, uh, it eventually builds up people using it. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, we, we uh, I think that's what we may be missing, <laughs> an well, opportunity. I would pull in Steve McGrew, because Steve McGrew somehow gets this stuff first, well before I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about once a week he's sending me a real zinger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, so I, I, I try to pull in Steve, and maybe he, maybe he would help organize a, a portal. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get in touch. You, you have his contact information. Oh yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, but I, yeah, I think it's it may be time to start pulling this together because I think we're about to make some major breakthroughs in analyzing embryos. Okay. Uh, and it's a question of critical mass of people and and a hell of a lot of computer programming by people who can are, who are sophisticated programmers. Uh, and you're going to drag a few biologists into it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kicking and screaming all the way. <laughs> okay, I think okay. I think that's a realistic expectation. Yeah. Okay. okay. But it's it, it's it's time. Uh, we have a paper that's uh, just submitted. Uh, it's being submitted today on uh, comparing uh, it's uh, differentiation waves versus the French flag model. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's. That's just going in today, uh, and uh, it, it points out how open this area is. So, uh, if that paper gets accepted, then we'll throw it in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds interesting. So, the French flag model uh, for Jesse's benefit is: uh, could you describe the French flag model? Real French flag, quick? Well, the French flag has three colors. Uh, to, uh, be with. Okay? In the French flag model, you assume that the organism is one dimensional, <laughs> like a worm, with an extremely thin worm, <laughs> a line of cells. <laughs> okay? You assume that there's a source of some chemical at one end and a sink of it at the other end, so it establishes a gradient uh, once it reaches steady state. Uh, and then you assume that the cells respond to a a certain to a range of concentrations and change into different kinds. So, uh, uh, in this case, the first third of the of the uh, line of cells would turn one color. I forgot the order of the colors in the French flag. Would turn, let's say, blue. The next one white. And the next one green, or whatever, whatever the colors are. Okay, I mean on the threshold. So the cell. So it, the French flag model is that there's a gradient set up somehow, usually not explained, and the cells respond to uh, differently depending on the, the value of the gradient at the cell, and then they change kinds. That's the French flag model. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Now, it differs from the Turing model, which we also discussed in that paper. The Turing model, you need at least two chemicals which interact with each other and set up waves. And then the cells respond to the concentration of one of the chemicals in the waves. Okay, so there's no source and sink. There's no uh, source and sink at one end and the other in the Turner model. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, and then the differentiation model is entirely different to the wave that propagates across the cells, and as the wave propagates, they change color. Okay, yeah. so uh, when you get different kinds of cells, you have to have consecutive waves. Okay, so the, so the, the paper is comparing these three models and the need to start extricating them from one another and trying to figure out what the embryos really do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's uh, we did that with a couple of Chinese guys in uh, Tennessee. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So it's literally being submitted today. We just finished it. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, that's uh, my impression is the field is ripe for takeoff, and a portal might be the right way to go to uh, start focusing people and getting collaborations going because there's, there's going to be a lot of collaboration needed like this engineering group in uh, well i think they're in seattle and san diego if you look just did this paper uh 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 i think they're all engineers and i as i said i i discovered the paper i couldn't i couldn't find mention of a particular organism so yeah <laughs> I, may, I may have missed it but uh but it's a nice general purpose program yeah. Okay. So I sent a note to them last night and see if they respond. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, so think about it. I, I don't know. Maybe the thing to do is look at some other portals. Uh, there's a portal for C. elegans, isn't there? Oh yeah, there are a lot. Of, well, there are a lot of like references, like uh, like the worm base I was showing. Uh, yeah. you know, that's got a series of papers. There's like worm book. So worm base is like you look up a gene and you find out information. Worm uh, book is where you have specific articles. Uh, so I mean, there there's a lot of stuff for C. elegans, but the way it's set up is usually like, as like almost like an archival resource where you have a, you know, a bunch of information. You look it up as like a neophyte. You might say, well, what does this gene do? What does this cell do? And then it gives you the information. So I mean, that's the way it would probably the best way to set it up. Although you could set it up in other ways, like just like, you know, a tree structure where you kind of like follow things down, you know, from a very general thing. Like I'm interested in microscopy, light microscopy, and then, you know, go down to different types. Uh, yeah, yeah. What are the alternatives in imaging embryos in three dimensions? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, there's a lot of fancy techniques being developed, uh, uh, you know, down to... Uh, you know, we've got the stuff that looks at single cells, segmentation, you've got the segmentation problems, you've got all sorts of fluorescent techniques, you've got the multiple photon imaging, and then you've got tracking of single uh, molecules inside cells. All of these things are, are coming, there's just a whole panoply of them, and they're sort of coming together now. Yeah. Uh, but they're all over the place, and... Uh, uh, I think we're going to get some major things, and then you know, and then we can also throw in some of the more esoteric ideas like your tree analysis, cybernetic systems, etc. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think there's a lot of a lot of room for uh, for growth so to speak in this. Well, it's, yeah, it's definitely hard to follow the literature because it's always like it's like next gen sequencing. There's always some new technique, and it's always hard to. Like yeah. sort of glean what they're doing, <laughs> you know. For this, how it fits for this paper, we, I, I tried to, for example, make a list of papers that combine finite element analysis with genetics, and it's really just a handful of papers, and the genetics is really light. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. and, okay. So you know, so you can see. What's happening there is the engineers kind of got the idea, but they don't know the genetics to do anything in depth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And the more the geneticists probably well, have no idea that the finite element methods are necessary to understand what's going on. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so at any rate, the, that, that might be a, a thing, thing about it. It's, okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, I'll think about it, yeah. Okay, i got to run. I've got a dental okay. appointment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, everyone, it's the top of the hour, so have a good week. Uh, if you need to contact me.